We're in the last phase of the story of Joseph in Egypt and his eventual reunion with his family that he has not seen for 20 years. Talk about a reunion. A little review. So far we've seen that a great famine predicted by Joseph or because of the Pharaoh's dream that Joseph interpreted has brought even his own family to Egypt in search for food. We see God's providence working there in a mighty way. Uh, Joseph, as a second in command, was screening all foreigners and he discovered his long lost brothers coming before him to buy grain. They didn't recognize him, of course, but he recognized them. Uh, he doesn't reveal himself right away, but instead he sets in motion a, a kind of a plan you know, to force his brothers to bring back his younger brother. And he does this by accusing them of being spies and keeping one of them as hostage until they return with their younger brother as proof that they're innocent of his you know, trumped up accusations. Now, in our last scene, the book describes the second visit to Egypt by the brothers who, along with their father's reluctant permission, bring Joseph's younger brother with them. And once they reach Joseph, he treats them to a fine meal and he honors them in his home. So this sets the scene for the reunion of these estranged brothers as Joseph reveals his true identity. Now, what Joseph had been doing was testing these men to see if there had been any changes in them. He wanted to see, did the, are these the same guys from 20 years ago that sold me into slavery? If they were the same selfish, godless, violent men, he could have them executed and save his younger brother from them. If they had changed, he could reveal himself and hope not only for a reunion, but also for a reconciliation. They were being reunited, you know, but they weren't reconciled, not yet. So what he finds out is that they have changed. They are united among themselves, anyways. Uh, they were ready to sacrifice for one another, right? J uh, Judah was ready to die. You know, take me, you know, if, if I don't, you know, he says to his dad, if, 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 I, if I don't bring home my brother, you know, I'll, I'll give my life. Uh, they were ready to admit their sin and accept God's punishment. You know, among themselves, when they were talking, you know, it was like, you see, I told you this would come back on us and God is punishing us for the bad things we did and so on and so forth. They weren't justifying themselves. They were acknowledging that they had been wrong and, and, and you know, what was happening to them was, you know, they were deserving it. And they no longer bore any jealousy towards their half-brother, but actually rejoiced at his honor at the hand of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Egyptian official. Remember, Joseph can hear what they're saying. It's a beautiful thing when you can speak two languages. You know? Lise and I have that you know, advantage. You know? uh, we're sitting there here in the United States, for example, at some event or something, and we're talking in English and we're here, and somebody who happens to speak French with someone else, and they're talking French, they don't, under, they don't realize that we can actually understand what they're saying. Of course, that cuts both ways. You, know? <laughs> you might not want to hear what they're saying, you know? but anyways. So Joseph you know, can, knows all of this because he is overhearing their conversation. So because of these things, Joseph could no longer contain his emotion and need uh, to reveal himself. So let's go to chapter 45. We pick up the story there, verse one. It says, then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried, have everyone go out, of, uh, go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. So even though he sends them out of the room, the servants hear and later report to Pharaoh the loud weeping that Joseph was doing as he declares his true identity. And so the brothers are amazed. Can you imagine the shock? 
<laughs> oh my goodness. I mean, before they thought they were in trouble, now it's like, uh-oh, now we're really in trouble, right? Um, the, um, the Hebrew word here could be translated into the English word troubled or also terrified. So they were terrified. They were afraid of this man who had power of life and death over him and then they find out that this is their brother whom they sold into slavery. If they felt guilty before, they really felt bad now. But Joseph, you know, he tries to calm them by asking about his father. Uh, it's interesting to note that um, if this reunion had not taken place, the family would have eventually been separated and assimilated into other nations. And so it was this turn of events that actually kept them together. All right? So we go uh, to verse uh, five, it says, now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. So Joseph wants to do four things with them. Number one, he wants to ease their minds that he is no longer angry or wanting revenge on them for what they did. I mean, he wants his family back. Secondly, he wants to tell them what's happened to him over the last 20 years because they're probably wondering, well, how, do, how can this be? How can you be second in command to the most powerful king uh, at the time Egypt was supreme? Not only is he in charge of the food project, but he's become an advisor to Pharaoh, a very important official. Thirdly, he wants to give God the glory by showing them that all of this was permitted by God to happen in order to show how great God is and to show how much He cares for His chosen people in preserving them. You know, Joseph has had a long time to think about things while he was in prison, while he was in jail, tremendous things that happened to him. He's seen God really work in his life and he wants to share that, the, the glory of that with his, uh, with his brothers. And then fourthly, of course, he wants to, a more practical way, he wants to prepare them for the five remaining, there's still five years of famine. That's a long time, think about that. Imagine seven years where nothing grows, pretty tough. They didn't have the, you know, the type of uh, irrigation systems and safety systems that we do. Uh, today. So let's keep reading the story, verse nine. It says, hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall live in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will also provide for you, for there are still five years of famine to come, and you and your household and all that you have would be impoverished. Behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth which is speaking to you. Now you must tell my father of all my splendor in Egypt, and all that you have seen, and you must hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. He kissed all of his brothers and wept on them, and afterwards his brothers talked with him. So Joseph shares with them the true urgency of the uh, situation. He tells them to bring his father with their families down. It's not just a family reunion, it's a question of survival. Now God had, there's a point here, the, you notice he spends a lot of time trying to convince his brothers to really convince his father to come. It's not just because the old man you know, was set in his ways and you know how it is when you get older, you don't want to go out much and you want to stay home and you know, traveling's for younger people and so on and so forth and moving you know, of all things. It wasn't that. God had not permitted the people to leave Canaan before. And now Joseph is convincing them by God's great work that this was indeed God's will for them. 
So God had always said you know, to them, don't leave. Abraham, every time he left Canaan and went to, you know, went to Egypt, he got himself into trouble. And so you know, the, the rule was, no, no, you stay put. That's why they just sent away for food. Last, a time before that, they had actually moved to get food. This time, he sends to go get food and bring it back. So if uh, for a couple of uh, you know, uh, decades or a century, God is telling you, you've got to do this, and then all of a sudden, you have to do completely the opposite thing, there needs to be a sign, there needs to be a way that you, know, you can be convinced. And so this is what Joseph is saying. You know, tell him all the great things that God has done as a way of convincing him that he needs to come, he and the family. So he'll eventually settle them in the land of Goshen, that's in northeastern Egypt, a very fertile region, about 900 square miles in size, about the size of, well actually when I was in Montreal, I used to say about the size of the city of, uh, of uh, Montreal. Um, after the initial burst and then serious discussion about plans, there's a second wave of emotion, uh, of emotion as Joseph, beginning with his natural full-blooded brother Benjamin, hugs and weeps with his uh, brother and then with all, of this, uh, uh, with all of his brothers, there's that very tender scene. If he would forgive this, uh, surely uh, he won't, uh, he won't you know, he won't uh, uh, pursue you on, on, on smaller issues. So each, except Benjamin, is forgiven. Each is reconciled in the arms of the other. Benjamin doesn't need to be forgiven, he wasn't there. You know, it was the jealousy of those uh, you know, against the two of them. And actually, uh, I think one of the reasons too is that Joseph wanted to make sure that Benjamin was still alive. You know, they killed me or they tried to kill me, how do I know they haven't you know, taken care of and gotten rid of Benjamin as well. That's why he was insisting that they bring Benjamin. He wanted to see for himself that his full brother uh, was still alive. So we keep going with the story in verse 16. It says, now when the news was heard in Pharaoh's house that Joseph's brothers had come, it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this, load your beasts and go to the land of Canaan and take your father and your households and come to me and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you will eat of the fat of the land. Now you are ordered, do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. Do not concern yourselves with your goods for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. So now uh, uh, the king uh, learns of Joseph's family and offers his own approval on their immigration, if you wish, strange word to use, but that's what it is, their immigration into Egypt. Joseph was the deliverer of Egypt, and so the people and the king and his officials, they're eager to help relocate his family. They owe him, I guess we'd say today. They owe him big time. So you know, taking care of the family was part of paying that debt of gratitude. Story continues in verse 21. Then the sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh, and gave them provisions for the journey. To each of them he gave changes of garments, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of, um, of garments. To his father he sent as follows, 10 donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt, and 10 female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and sustenance for his father on the journey. So he sent his brothers away, and as they departed, he said to them, do not quarrel on the journey. So Joseph provides them with the goods and gifts to bring to, ja uh, to uh, Jacob. Uh, he gives even more to Benjamin, and the brothers don't say a word. There's no infighting. They're just happy to be alive. They're just happy that they're going to have food and they're not going to be thrown in jail. And they, the thing that they felt guilty about has now been purged. And I think all of us can relate to that, can't we? We do something wrong, something stupid or whatever, and we're forgiven for that. And it, there's a feeling of relief and actual a feeling of joy that comes when, when, we are, uh, when we are forgiven. Now he tells them not to fall out of the way, meaning not to be distracted, not to be troubled after they leave. The, here it just says quarrel, but that word has a larger meaning than that. It's not just don't fight among yourselves, but don't be distracted, don't let little things, don't major in minors, you know, let's just do what, what we've agreed to, uh, to do. And so it continues, then they went up from Egypt, came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. 
They told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and indeed he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. But he was stunned, for he did not believe them. When they told him all the words of Joseph that he had spoken to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. Then Israel said, it is enough. My son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I, uh, before I die. So the brothers must have heeded Joseph's admonition because there's, not, there's no comment made about their trip back. Upon hearing the news, Jacob is overcome by emotion. Eventually he believes what he thought was impossible, that his son was still uh, alive. You know, the brothers had the benefit, they saw him in person. Jacob's just taking their word for it. And they lied about him being dead before, so you know, he's having problems with that. Now the Bible doesn't say but in their attitude of repentance, it may be that the brothers finally unburdened their story. Because the father's going to ask, come on, he's alive, okay, that's great, I'm happy. Wait a minute, how, did, how is he alive? You told me that you, know, you brought home the, 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 his coat and it was full of blood. You know, whoa, whoa, something's not working here. You know, after the initial jolt, the dad's probably putting two and two together. So you know, the whole story comes out eventually. So Israel says, enough. He doesn't care about the details. His son is alive. He's going to go see him. You know, you know, it's like we say many times, that's in the past. You know, it's water under the bridge. Nothing I can do about that now. Let's just, let's just go forward. Okay? So now we go to verse, or chapter 46, rather, Israel in Egypt. So all of his life, Jacob has sought the Lord for his important decisions in his life. And even though Joseph has invited him and there is a great famine, God could end the famine and he could just go visit Joseph. You see what I'm saying? The famine could end and instead of moving everybody, he'd just take a trip and go visit his son and just go back home. You know? So Canaan is his home, the land that God has promised him and his future generations, and now he has to uproot and move everyone to an unknown land. You know, I told you before, God said, you know, stay there, don't go to Egypt. Now he's telling them to go to Egypt. But the other thing is, God told him that this land's going to be your land. You're going to, you're going to have all of this. It's all going to be yours. So now he must be wondering, well, wait a minute, this is all going to be mine? You know, I, I can understand it'll be mine if I settle here, if I have 12 sons and they have children and we grow and eventually you know, take the land. You know, human thinking, human thinking. But now he says, no, no, you've got to go back to Egypt. So he must be wondering, well, wait a minute, how, how, how's the land promise going to be fulfilled if I'm moving back to Egypt? So he's overjoyed at finding Joseph but he's perplexed about leaving Canaan. So God's will, you know, is, have you found that God's will is sometimes a little difficult to determine? <laughs> have you ever said in your prayer, Lord, you know I want to do what you want me to do, but I'm not quite sure here exactly what it is you want me to do. You know, I'm willing, Lord, but you know, your will is just not very clear. So he's, Jacob's having one of these moments here. So with that in mind, let's start reading Chapter 46, it says, So Israel set out with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, Here I am. He said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt and I will also surely bring you up again and Joseph will close your eyes. So it seemed that all the circumstances and the open doors kept pointing him to Egypt and so Jacob packed up along with all of his families and he heads towards Egypt. But he stops along the way at Beersheba where he had lived with his father Isaac. That's the significance of that. It was the last stop along the way. It was like the point of no return. Once they went past Beersheba, that was it. Then it was, it was on to Egypt, okay? So he again offers sacrifices and prayers, and God once again speaks to him, blesses him, encourages him by telling him that it's okay to go down, and he will bless him there. Now, in hindsight, we can see some of the advantages for the Israelites living in Egypt. There were advantages there. For example, 
First of all, they would survive the famine, which they wouldn't do if they lived in Canaan. Secondly, they would be living in, a, in an advanced society and they would learn many useful things for later on. Uh, thirdly, there was less danger of intermingling in Egypt than in Canaan. And the reason for that is that the Egyptians would not intermarry with shepherds. Not that they were Jewish, but that they were shepherds. And so the Israelites would be free to increase their people without pagan intermarrying. In Canaan, there were many different tribes there, many different you know, uh, uh, groups that were there that, that did many, you know, had many different uh, skills, farmers, shepherds, and so on and so forth. So the danger of their children and children's children intermarrying was great. In Egypt, as I said, that was not going to be a problem. Because even if they wanted to marry an Egyptian, the Egyptians would not marry them. They would, they, you know, they, they would not intermarry with them. Also, living in a foreign land would strengthen their bonds as a family and force them to develop a particular culture to themselves. Uh, Lise and I have found that, you know, working, do, doing mission work and you know, moving so many times in ministry seems to be many, you, know, you have a lot of moves in your life. You know, and what we found out is that, um, that our children grew closer together because they were each other's friends and buddies because they had to move so many times. You know? So when you're always the new kid, it's nice when your brother's in that class over there and your sister's in that class over there and, and they, they grew to depend on one another because you know, uh, go, for good or for bad, uh, they, they, they started wondering when the next move was going to happen. You know? so, but they worked it out and the, the beautiful thing is as they grew up they truly did become each other's best friends. So that was a great blessing on our family. So the same thing is happening here with this, with this family. They depend on one another and become very strong together. And finally they would less, be less likely to worship Egyptian gods and so the teachings of their patriarchs would remain intact. So it was a way of bringing them together and solidifying the family bonds. And so with this understanding, we continue to read. It says, Then Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob and their little ones and their wives in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They took their livestock and their property, which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and came to Egypt, Jacob and all of his descendants with him his sons and his grandsons with him, his daughters and his granddaughters, and all of his descendants he brought with him to, uh, to Egypt. So in a very general way, the writer describes the migration of Israel and his family and their possessions from Canaan to Egypt. Now there's another section here, uh, verse eight, all the way down to 25. We're not going to read that. Uh, this section begins the important task of listing the genealogies of each son as they left the land of Canaan. Very important because you, when they return, you know, it's important to know who belongs to what tribe because God will apportion a piece of land, you know, a territory to each particular tribe. So later on, as I say, the records are used to determine who will serve at the tabernacle and where they will live in the land of promise. Now the lists that are in verses 8 to 25, uh, they go in order of wives with Leah's children listed first, then her servant, followed by Rachel and her servant. So the sons, the daughters, the children are all listed, even Joseph's sons, showing that the lists were compiled after this event took place, because at the time you know, Jacob didn't know that Joseph had two sons, so we, we, we surmise from that uh, understanding that this was written after this event took place. So we pick up the story now in verse 26. It says, all the persons belonging to Jacob who came to Egypt, his direct descendants, not including the wives of Jacob's sons, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came to Egypt were 70. So the final tally that the writer gives here is that there were 70 people that came to Egypt. Now this doesn't represent the exact number counting all the grandchildren, so on and so forth, but it is a representative number that includes the immediate family. Uh, and there's a reason for that number. 
Jew Jewish numerology, very interesting, gave certain meaning to certain numbers. 70 is a special number in Jewish history and Jewish theology. The number four, for example, represents the world. North, south, east, west, four represents the world. The number three represents God, three persons in God. And the number 10 represents perfection, maturity, something that is mature, completely mature, the number 10. So you, know, you have 10 commandments, you know, all right? And so if you take uh, four plus three times 10, you get 70, all right? And the number 70 itself uh, is uh, very special in Jewish history and numerology. Uh, 70 elders, for example, in Numbers 11, uh, 16, there were 70 elders that were helping uh, Moses. Uh, 70 years of captivity in 2 Chronicles 36. Uh, there were 70 translators of the Hebrew Old Testament into the Greek language called the Septuagint. And it was called the Septuagint because there were 70 you know, uh, uh, scholars that worked on translating it from Hebrew to Greek. The reason for that is there came a time when the Jews, uh, many of them, no longer spoke Hebrew because of the Greek influence. And so they had to translate the Hebrew scriptures into the language of the people, which at the time was Greek. And so that particular translation, the Greek translation of the Hebrew, okay, what we call the Old Testament, is called the Septuagint because of the 70 scholars. There were 70 members of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling body, uh, during Jesus' time. And there were 70 witnesses sent out by Christ in Luke chapter uh, 10, verse one. So the, uh, these 70 represent the founders of the Jewish society and culture who went into Egypt as a family and they came out 400 years as a nation. So they go in as a family, they go out as a nation. All right. So a couple of lessons here from this. We'll stop here. I, I'm reading pretty much all of it because you know, it's a narrative. And who better to tell the story than the ones who experienced the story and wrote it down for us. All I'm trying to do is kind of color in the edges and give some background you know, to help keep it in context. But there are some, even this simple story of, you know, he sends for his father, his father comes to meet him and there's a reunion. There's some pretty important lessons there that we can, uh, that we can uh, learn. First of all, you never know. You never know. You never know what or why God is testing you. You never know. That's why we shouldn't get angry and upset when things go wrong or when you know, we're not getting our way. We should pause and ask ourselves, okay, Lord, <laughs> What's going on? You know, Joseph didn't know for 13 years why what was happening was actually happening to him. He didn't know why. His brothers didn't know why their lives were being put upside down. They thought they knew, but they were so surprised when they found out, weren't they? And Jacob, he didn't know why he was losing his family, even his life at a time when God was supposed to bless him. Here, all his life, God's supposed to bless him. Well, what happens? Joseph is dead, and now the, the, his other sons are kidnapped in a foreign country. What's going on? So you never know why or for what reason God is testing you, but you're always happy when you pass the test. <laughs> so, as I said at the beginning, we need to be careful not to complain too loudly and not to lose faith too quickly or not to get angry at God too easily because you never know what He's going to do with you. It's not a question of Him doing something to you. It's what is He doing with you? Because God is not a man. He's not a human being. We do things to each other. But God doesn't do to things to you, He does things with you. He uses us in some way. The question is, how useful am I going to be? <laughs> Lesson number two, God will be there when you need Him. 
I love Marty's sermon from a couple of weeks back there. He called it the open wallet sermon. And he said, what would you rather have? You know, you know, a million dollars, you know, or would you rather have the way God does it? The, when something comes up, you look in your wallet, oh, there's just, just enough. You know? There's always just enough to take care of what you need to take care of. But human nature always wants money up front. <laughs> I believe, Lord, just, just you know, give me a, a cushion. We're always looking for a cushion. I believe so long as you give me a comfortable cushion, financial cushion or whatever cushion. But we find out that God, He doesn't work that way. So God planned and prepared 20 years ahead of time to supply what Jacob needed even before Jacob was aware that he would be needing something. So God knows the future, He knows the results of our decisions, and even if He tries to influence us to make good ones through His word and spirit, he doesn't force us to make good choices. We have to make the choice. He allows us to experience the results of even our bad choices, you know, like parents, right? Some kids say, no, 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 this is the one I want. I don't know, whatever. You know, I want this, this bike over here and you know it's a cheap bike, it's going to fall apart. No, no, but it's got streamers on it, so that's the one that I want. Fine, all right. You know, and then two weeks later the thing falls apart. You know, but sometimes kids have to learn quote, the hard way. And I think God does that with us too. He just lets us learn the hard way. If that's what you want, okay. And He also permits bad things to happen to us that we have no control over. Even that. But in all of this, He plans and works in such a way to be there when we need Him and provide what we need when we reach the point of need. Our thing is always we want it in advance. And He says, no, no, well, I'll take care of it when the time comes. So Jesus says that our Father knows what we need before we ask Him. And this is because He has been planning for our need long before we arrived at it. Our asking is a sign of faith that acknowledges this particular fact. And then maybe one other lesson here, and that is always search for God's will before you decide. That sounds like an easy thing, but I can tell you how many times I've blown this one. <laughs> I've decided ahead and I've marched ahead, you know, and halfway down the road I stopped and go, oh, by the way, God, I hope this is okay with you. <laughs> Usually when things are starting to go south, you know. So Jacob, you know, he had many definite signs that God wanted him to go to Egypt. His problem was that this seemed to contradict God's earlier promise to give him the land of Canaan and the instruction to stay there. We talked about this. So Jacob responded to the leading of the Lord with caution and prayer, seeking the Lord's word and will to actually confirm this change in his life. Of course, he finally received it at Beersheba when God actually spoke to him. Now, today, you know, we don't have God audibly speaking or appearing to us in a you know, mysterious or, or supernatural way, if you wish, but that doesn't mean He doesn't direct us. That doesn't mean He doesn't communicate with us in particular ways so that we know His will. So let me list just a couple of those ways that He kind of you know, communicates with us? First of all, there's His Word. His Word contains all that we need for instruction and holy living and service, but we need to consult it. You know, in 2 Timothy 3.16, what does Paul say? Every scripture is inspired by God or breathed by God, and what? And is profitable for what? Teaching, instruction. Proving, you know, proving things that are true or not true. Training in righteousness. So all of, the, all of the things that we need to live a Christian life, Paul says the scriptures are there. But we don't take advantage of it if we don't read it. That's why I'm always you know, encouraging people, become a daily Bible reader, become a regular Bible reader. You know, make, the, make it a point to create the habit in your life that you carve out some time 
15 minutes, 20, whatever it is, every single day that you just could read a chapter. What I do is I read um, in my own reading. I don't mean at the office when I'm studying. Or, I mean at home when the day is over and the work is over. I commit myself every day. I read at least two, maybe three chapters of, of the scriptures. And sometimes they're like in the Psalms, they're you know, two tiny little, two or three tiny little chapters. Okay, fine, I read my three chapters, that's it. Sometimes they're much longer. And every single day, when that moment comes, there's always something, uh, 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 something else that I'd rather do. Like I'd like to get to today's newspaper. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd like to open today's newspaper and read about you know, whatever is taking place. Or maybe I'm reading a book or something, a novel, you know, just for enjoyment's sake. I'd love to find out what's happening. You know, they left me hanging at the last chapter and what's going to happen. You know, there's always something. But I've never regretted saying, you know what, I'll do my Bible reading first and I'll do that first and then I'll get on to these, to these other things. It's just a habit. And my, my idea is it's my way of, of eliminating at least that much of the world in me on that particular day. At least there's 20 minutes of, of my time or half hour, whatever it is, 50, that I, I was not consuming the world, but I was co consuming the Spirit instead. Because we don't all have two, three hours a day to read the Bible. We got work to do and things to happen and kids to raise and whatever else to do. You know what I'm saying? So it's always a challenge, but we never, we never regret it because His Word can guide us. Uh, his church. The church provides direction and encouragement through its leadership and example and teaching. If I don't know something, I'll ask somebody. I'll ask the preacher, I'll ask another preacher, I'll talk to another elder and have a discussion with them. If I have a difficult decision, I'll sit down with a, with a brother that I have confidence in and I'll talk with him. You know, I, I mentioned Harold, he's here, but he knows, boy, he's had a lot of my phone calls you know, when I had important decisions to make in my life and I just needed to bounce it off somebody. So the church you know, is there also. God directs us through His church. He also uses the Holy Spirit to lead us as we study the Word through the influence in our conscience and, and, and opportunities that we uh, encounter in our daily lives. You know, that thing inside of you that says, uh, I don't think you ought to be doing that. <laughs> That's not Satan. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or how about giving a little bit more? You know, you're giving and then, and then something inside you, oh, you could do better than that. You know, who's, who's talking to you? That's not the devil. You know, we like to say that's our better self. Well, who controls our better self? Well, I would hope to think that it's the Spirit of God that controls our better self. The thing is, a lot of times we don't listen to that better self. We go, tsh, tsh, tsh. not now, or too much, or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So God does work all things for good, and the Holy Spirit is God, who works these things out in our daily, in our daily lives. And then, of course, our own judgment and experience used under God's influence, that also helps us make wise and proper decision. Use your best judgment and your best experience. So when we accept the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives through repentance and baptism, He's the one that directs us through His Word and His Spirit and His church and our conscience and our judgment in order to make decisions that will be in concert with His will and His plan for our lives. The other thing I might mention too is we don't always know right away that that, that was really God's will, but eventually we do. You know, eventually we do because we see the fruit of our decisions. Sometimes we make wrong ones, well then we have to say, you know what, I don't think I need to keep going in this direction here because I obviously have made the wrong decision, so I'm, I'm going to go to the other way. But God will let you know. So if we search for it, God will reveal His will for our lives in every area of our lives. And I, I'm, I'm persuaded that He's pleased when we seek Him and He has promised that those who seek will, will find, right? Those who seek Him will find Him. All right, so that's lesson 47, three to go and we continue this very last narrative. Joseph is the last story in Genesis. You know, it'll end with him. You know. So we'll continue that next time. Thank you for your attention.